Welcome to this video lecture. This is Mark Scythian, FAA licensed aerospace technician, airframe, power plant, and avionics certified. The date today is July 30th, 2016. In this video lecture, we are going to discuss airplane airfoil types and fixed wing structures, i.e. airplane aerodynamic structures, including wings and stabilizers. All airplanes are created unequal and have different functions. Based on what is desired in an airplane, one may need to choose from many different specifications to fulfill a certain flight function. Based on what is desired for an airplane flight function, the certified airframe structural specifications approved by aerospace engineers are to be accessed and can and can include wing aspect ratio, airfoil type, flight speed limits, airplane weight, wing loading in pounds per square foot, watts power required per pound of weight, wing lift distribution, wing configuration plan form type, high lift device configuration if applicable, wing tip washout for tapered wings only, lift to drag ratios based on speed and climb slash descent, mean effective takeoff horsepower, Reynolds number limit, coefficient of lift and drag limits, airframe structure construction techniques, flight control surface rigging limits, drag area, wetted area, and cruise drag, approved propeller and power plant configurations, adverse weather condition limitations, and finally FAA approved type certificate data sheets if in the United States. This list I put together are the basic minimum 20 points for evaluating the specifications required when picking a certain airplane application. So it depends on what the function is desired for an airplane. Throughout the aerodynamic video lectures in my YouTube channel I will eventually go over the definitions and applications of each of these terms. Some of these terms will be in this video and some of these terms are also in previous videos and videos to come. Often builders of airplanes, especially in the light sport and general aviation categories, will consult with an FAA licensed A&P mechanic, also known as an aerospace technician, when manufacturing or maintaining aircraft in order to implement accurate and safe airplane development in accordance to certified aeronautical engineering data. It is important that the airplane's control authority is maximized, allowing for quick airplane three-axis response when pilot makes inputs at the control yoke. If airflow separation or underpowered situations exist, the control authority of the airplane can be compromised and little or no response of airplanes three axis control can take place, making for dangerous flight conditions. It is always important to pick the correct aeronautical data configuration and specifications when reflecting on the application and function of the given airplane that is to be constructed. For all intents and purposes, certified aeronautical data already exists for any existing technology of an airplane application on the market today. It is important that the builder or aerospace technician obtains certified aeronautical engineering data prior to constructing a given airplane. Once the choice is made to, let's say, build a light sport airplane, LSA, there are countless designs already certified by the industry's leading aerospace engineers for this particular airplane application. By picking the appropriate aeronautical data, the airplane builder or aerospace technician can manufacture airframe components in accordance to certified specifications for the given airplane function. 
This video lecture will cover some basic understanding of what to look for when accessing certified airframe structural specifications. We start first with the certified aeronautical data for a given airfoil. In this case, it is the NACA 4412 airfoil. And on this graph, the certified engineering specifications indicating the critical angle limits of the airfoil listed here from zero to almost 20 degrees. The alpha, is a uh, the alpha symbol is the degrees. Then we have the Reynolds number limits based off the cord length. And then, of course, the angle translated to the coefficient of lift. This also allows for the coefficient of wing drag only to be accessed. Of course, other graphs are required, such as the overall drag coefficient of the entire airplane, including the engine and propeller assemblies, and also the overall drag area, and most importantly, the lift to drag ratios. But this is one among the graphs that should be consulted when trying to understand which airfoil is applicable to a given application. Most of the time, airplane kits or recommended airplanes for a given function include all of this data. This video lecture covers some of the basics involved in interpreting airfoil capabilities. Another important aspect when constructing an airfoil from engineering specifications and blueprints is to place the dimension limits of the airfoil onto plotting graph. A plotting graph for manufacturing this particular airfoil, a NACA 0012, would be placed onto a one-to-one -one scale plotting graph so that coordinates can be isolated and then accurate curves can be extrapolated into the proper dimensions on a builder's board. The builder's board allow a one-to-one -one ratio of the blueprint to the material so that the construction and manufacturing of the airfoil sheet can accurately be implemented. Next is a more technical dimensionality of an airfoil. On the design level, this is some of the limits being used, and it's good to just keep in mind what is going on so that when you're done constructing an airfoil, you actually can match your completed or constructed airfoil to the original engineering design, and then you'll be able to do the quality control analysis based off the leading edge leading edge radius and leading edge radius slope and then the percent thickness you can actually properly verify if your work was done accurately by using this dimensionality system. How to interpret airfoil percent thickness data the percent thickness is simply the ratio of the thickest height of the airfoil divided into the length of the airfoil, also known as the wing cord. So here it says the maximum thickness is at 30% of the cord. So we would say somewhere here is where the thickness, 30% is about this point here. So if it's 1, 30% would be 0.3. So right there is where you would have the thickest point. And then if you measure from the top of the thickest point of the airfoil to the bottom and take that value and then divide it into the length, you will end up with this 11.7% thickness value. Next is the different shapes of airfoils in both subsonic and supersonic applications and as you can see here the symmetrical airfoil is going to have more of a Newtonian lift component rather than a Bernoulli's lift component. 
That is because the symmetrical airfoil has an even and identical airflow speed at the top and the bottom. So there's less lift force happening from airflow speed differential than there is from mass airflow acceleration. Force is equal to mass times acceleration represents the Newtonian lift component, whereas force is equal to pressure times area represents the Bernoulli component. So if you desire a fast speed, a high speed airplane, which has less drag with more engine power, then you can stick with a symmetrical air, uh, a symmetrical airfoil. And you notice that uh, the drag will be less. And the only way the air stays on this type of an airfoil is from speed. You can see it take the shape of a symmetrical form. And then when you change the angle positive, this is where you get the uh, differential in pressure. So this is perfect for high speed airplanes, even making it somewhat thinner. Now if you have an airplane that's going to fly somewhat slower and you need to make up for more lift, then you can have a semi-symmetrical airfoil which has a bit of Bernoulli and a bit of Newtonian lift involved as you can see here. Now the flat bottom, this produces or develops a lot of lift at low speeds, but it has a lot of drag, so it's limited at higher speeds. This is the type of airfoil that you would use on a recreational airplane, like a glider, or a hang glider, or an ultralight, even a light sport airplane with a little more engine power. And this here uses a good, perfect balance of both Bernoulli and Newtonian lift, because you can see that the distance at the top of the airfoil is much longer than the distance at the bottom of the airfoil, so they call that a flat bottom airfoil, and so the speed can be as much as twice as fast on the top of the air compared to the bottom. So right there you're getting quite a lot of pressure lift from Bernoulli, and then when you change the angle you're getting quite a lot of lift from Newtonian force component on the airfoil. So this is excellent at getting uh, quite a lot of lift at low speeds, so it's perfect for like a hang glider or an ultralight if you're building uh, on your own something custom built, this would be an appropriate airfoil to use due to the fact that they have a uh, mixture, an even mixture of both uh, Bernoulli and Newtonian components. And then finally there's the under cambered. This is a wing shape as if you have your flaps on all the time. This will produce even more lift, but it's very limited on speed. So something that flies very, very slow and has a lot of lift and cannot go any faster would be the undercambered. This here, as you can see, already has like a inherent permanent wing flap shape, the whole wing, and it would take a little bit more work to build the curves in compared to a flat bottom. But if you're flying something very slow, we'll just arbitrate here something like 50 mile per hour ultralight and you can't you don't want to go any faster and you're not seeking to limit the drag you just want to fly very slow something like a slow speed sailplane because there are high speed sailplanes too but this would be something you would implement if you wanted to get off the ground at very very low speed something foot launch like a foot launch hang glider you could use the under cambered but don't expect to go very fast. A powered hang glider might use one of these two uh, for li a lot of lift, but very limita li very uh, a, a limitation on airspeed because of the high drag. So these have a lot of lift, but a lot of drag, and these have less drag and uh, less lift. They need more speed to stay uh, airborne. So all airfoils that are subsonic are a combination of one of these four or each of these four, there's tens of thousands of certified airfoils and the ones that represent airplanes below the speed of sound are one of four or a mixture of these shapes. And of course the supersonic airfoil is like a diamond profile to handle the shock waves that are associated with breaking the sound barrier. So whatever airplane blueprints that you've chosen for a specific airplane function, 
once you're done building all the airfoils, then you would put it together and reinforce them with wing spars and then cover it up with sheet metal or an appropriate laminate. The sheet metal or the laminate withstands great tensile pressures, meaning that it's very, very hard to stretch apart sheet metal or a composite laminate. You have to put much, much force to try to stretch it apart. So when you laminate sheet metal onto a airframe wing structure and you do a good job with the workmanship and the riveting, now the wing has a lot of strength if you want to bend or twist or put the wing under compression, tension, and torsional stresses. Now the wing skin has to hold up against that and it's very hard to stretch apart the sheet metal. It takes quite a lot of force and tensile force to rip that sheet metal apart. So when the sheet metal is laminated on the wing structure properly with good workmanship, you're now taking the stresses of this wing, whether it's bending or twisting. The bending would be a blend of compressive and tensile stresses, and the twisting would be a blend of those forces, but as torsional twisting stresses. Now you're absorbing it into the sheet metal, and the sheet metal is very, very hard to stretch apart. So now you've accomplished building a high strength to weight ratio airframe structure, something that can hold up against great stresses and nominal weight, including the acceleration and g-forces, but yet at the same time it's relatively lightweight for as much force lift as it's creating. So this is the principle of airframe structural construction, is that you're putting together a shape of an airfoil from 2D to 3D and you're placing enough wing ribs to support the structural laminate whether it be composite or sheet metal uh, covering on the wing. So now you've got a high strength to weight ratio aircraft structure. This is known as an aerodynamic structure because it uses air flow to develop force lift. Anything that is dynamic is developing force. So if it was thermodynamic it would get force from heat and aerodynamic means you're getting force from gas flow. In this case the gas is air. And then lastly once you cut out your ribs you have the pre-assembly rough-in fitting before you go ahead and run the spars to connect through the attachment retainers where stringers can go through as well to distribute the stresses and the torsional movement of the airfoil. So you don't want the construction to be too rigid but you want some flexibility and absorbing stresses while you also have a good amount of dynamic to static rigidness involved and this is how the wing holds up against many stresses involved in flight. And then after that, when you're finished, depending what structure this is, if this was the wing, you could then go to your control surface tabs and then separate these right on the perforations and then laminate a separate flight control structure. So if this was a wing, uh, if this was a primary wing, this might be the inboard flap, and this might be the outboard aileron. If this was a horizontal stabilizer, assuming symmetrical or inverted flat bottom, so there's good downlift, then this would be a hinged elevator. And if this was a vertical stabilizer, assuming symmetrical airfoil, this flight control structure would be the rudder. So you have the horizontal stabilizer and elevator or the vertical stabilizer and rudder and then the same principle can be applied to the wings. The wings are then control surface isolated for the inboard flat 
and the outboard aileron. So however you want to do it, or however the blueprints tell you to do it, you have the piano hinges, and then you have the actuators, whether they're manual with cable, or they're electro-hydraulic, however it is in the blueprint. So this is the basic aerodynamic structure development and construction technique for all the airplanes out there. And of course materials are a big thing because when the materials improve, you can do more with them because they have a higher strength and they have a lower weight and you need to use less material to get the same effect. The reinforcement structures are minimized and then you can do more with that airplane. But this video focuses on the basic airfoil and aerodynamic structure concept and development. Thank you for watching this video and have a great day.